Well, hello, everyone. Uh, we are just coming up to uh, a couple of minutes past three o'clock, and I can see we're up to, uh, can't quite count how many, but we must be about 135, 140 uh, participants, which is pretty good. So I'm going to suggest we make a start now. So uh, hello, everyone. My name is John Kerno. I'm the Director of Analysis and Chief Economist at DEFRA. Uh, and I'm welcoming you this afternoon to our first ever Analysis in Government Sharing uh, webinar. So welcome. Thank you for joining us. Uh, and I hope you're all keeping well at the sort of, uh, in these sort of peculiar times that we're uh, living in. Uh, and of course, we're quite familiar with this sort of technology and, and events of this sort now, aren't we? So uh, thank you very much for joining this webinar. It's been organised by the Best Practice and Impact Division at ONS. And it's a chance for us as members of the government analysis function to find out more about topics of importance to us uh, right across the analyst uh, community. The idea is it's going to help us with a culture of shared innovation uh, across government. And I particularly want to thank uh, David Mace and the team at ONS for organising this. And this will be the first of a series of these webinars. Now, I should say up front, you can probably see that at the top of your screen that the meeting is being recorded and the recording has now started. So by joining this, you are giving consent uh, for the meeting to be recorded. Uh, as I said a moment ago, we've got, um, well, we've actually now got about 170, 180 people uh, on the call. So we've got a really good uh, turnout and we've really got a really good session, uh, session uh, and webinar today. Um, uh, so let's talk about what we're going to cover today. Uh, today we're going to cover uh, evaluation of complex policies. So uh, I've worked in different bits of government over the years. Evaluation, I think, is really important for what we do in terms of policy making. Uh, and I suspect we're not as good at it as we could be in government. So how do we really know policies are achieving uh, their objectives? Are they delivering the outcomes we intended? Are they providing good value for money? Are there some perverse incentives, some adverse impacts from some of our policies? You know, we really want to understand that so we can potentially redesign the policies that we've got, but also evidence from that can help us when we're designing new policies in new areas as well. Uh, and of course, I think what most of you will know within the analyst community, actually, this has really gone up the agenda over the last year with the centre of government really emphasising the importance of this and particularly important around actually how we think about our policies and our bids at times like the spending review as well. But evaluating policies is really tricky uh, and lots of, them, lots of them are really complex. So we're going to hear more about that this afternoon. Uh, you know, good evaluation, good policy evaluation uses a range of research methods uh, to really systematically investigate the effectiveness of policy interventions and think about the implementation of the processes and really help us determine the value uh, for different stakeholders. So what we've got today is we're going to have four, uh, four teams speaking to us uh, with particular examples that focus on complexity. Now, there's going to be an opportunity to put questions uh, to our speakers today. Uh, if I could ask you to use the Teams chat to set out your questions as we go along. But what I'm going to suggest we do is I'm going to try and keep uh, track of those questions that you put on there and put them to the speakers. But I'll do that after everybody has had an opportunity uh, to speak. And the other thing I'd just say, and I, I should make sure I remind you about this at the end, if you do need help with evaluation and you want, want to link up with other evaluators in government, uh, there's, uh, there's a sort of an evaluation uh, support uh, email address uh, at the ONS that can help on that as well. Uh, and uh, David, you might want to put that up in the team chat uh, as well, perhaps. OK, so I will uh, introduce each of the speakers in turn, but I'll just sort of set out all four of them uh, for you at the moment. So we're going to start uh, Taryn McMillan uh, from DEFRA. Uh, we'll talk about DEFRA's approach to uh, evaluating complex environmental policy. And Taryn's uh, going to be joined by uh, Leila and Simon. I'll let them introduce themselves uh, when they get there. Then we'll have Claire and Matt uh, from DWP, and they'll talk about DWP's Reducing Parental Conflict Programme. Then we'll have Samaya from the Cabinet Office, who will provide an overview of the new Evaluation Task Force. And then our final speaker will be Heidi from MOJ, who will talk about MOJ's evaluation of the Prison Security Investment Programme. So as I say, if you could, uh, if you could put your questions in the chat, what I'll do is allow all, uh, all the speakers uh, to do their, their sort of uh, their presentations, and they'll vary between 
10, 15 to 20 minutes each. And then at the end, we'll open up for a panel discussion. I'll use the questions that you've put in that chat for me. And I can see now we're up to uh, uh, over 220 attendees. So that is a great uh, turnout on a Friday afternoon uh, for this. OK, so without further ado, uh, Taryn, can I hand to you as the first presenter and uh, please introduce yourself uh, and the team. Thanks, Taryn. Great, thank you, John. Hello, everyone. I'm Tara McMillan, Head of Evaluation at DEFRA, um, and I'm joined today with my colleagues, Leila Berkeley and uh, Simon Shrimpton. And what we wanted to do first off in talking about evaluating complex policies was really uh, share with you our approach, which we've developed over the last two and a half years or so um, in addressing evaluating complex policies within DEFRA. Um, so I'll run you through a little bit of the context um, and a bit of the start of that story and then I'll hand over to colleagues in my team to talk through some of the detail and some of the products that have come from that. So, uh, there we go, perfect. Um, so as a bit of an overview, um, I'll just set out a little bit more of the context and the kind of uh, policy fields that we deal with uh, in DEFRA, um, and then a little bit of the products which have come out as a result of it. So the complexity evaluation framework um, and DEFRA's own approach to theory of change, uh, which we'll get onto. So as context, um, this is a slide which um, has previously been shared by our previous uh, Chief Scientific Advisor, Ian Boyd, and um, to really summarise the way uh, the, the types of um, outcomes and the types of things which DEFRA really deals with. Um, and it's uh, characterised the spheres, the systems that we deal with, with uh, three different types of uh, challenging aspects of complexity. The first is that the policies that we deal with are often multifaceted. That is that they uh, have multi, multiple moving parts. Uh, there's a lot of interconnections um, and they can interact, interconnect and intersect in lots of differing ways. And that can be quite challenging for us um, in being able to map out how a policy is going to work in practice, but also in terms of being able to evaluate and measure and evidence how that policy is working. Equally, there's a classic issue with a number of the policy areas which DEFRA uh, deals with around isolating contribution. So we have quite a lot of what is what can be called uh, noise, for example, whereby uh, we might be measuring something. It could be an environmental indicator, uh, and there might be a number of different things which are happening in the natural world which are um, affecting what we're collecting where it comes to that kind of data. We also, being DEFRA and dealing with a lot of environmental outcomes and social and economic, have issues around timescales and unpredictability, um, particularly uh, where we might be implementing something as simple as tree planting. Um, there can be quite a lot of unpredictability as to how those trees will grow. There's a lot of factors which can get in the way, which uh, can blur that sort of uh, causation story that we might be trying to tell about how our interventions are working. Um, and these sort of three issues taken together are, are, are quite common across most of the policy areas that we deal with. This poses a huge amount of challenges where it comes to uh, evaluation for us. Uh, traditionally within evaluation we're trying to have that clear causal pathway, a clear understanding of uh, how our interventions are leading to outcomes and a lot of that pathway is getting blurred, it's getting moved around, it's, it's harder to see and harder for us to measure. To give you a more detailed example of that, uh, you can see uh, this is a particularly complex policy area um, within DEFRA. So this map that you see in front of you is uh, from our future farming area of policy, um, very much engaged with what uh, we're going to replace the common agricultural policy with in coming years following EU exit. And this is a very large systems map um, where we've got a number of different coloured nodes uh, that sit in and around that, which uh, represent stakeholder interests, policy and in policy intervention, uh, departmental interests, and other factors. And then we've got a lot of connections between those nodes, uh, both positive and, and negative. So you can see how interconnected a range of different factors and a range of different things that we're trying to do really can be. And this is just one policy area, which in itself will be interconnected with other areas. So incredibly complex where it comes to being able to measure and attribute any one single intervention that might sit within this complicated nest. So what does this mean uh, for complexity and in DEFRA evaluation? Well, pretty early on uh, in establishing uh, the central strategic evaluation team, we were aware that we needed to have tools 
and methods and means by which we could try and capture some of this and conceptualize some of this. So really being able to give a clear understanding and some clear thinking about what we needed to be measuring and how we could theorize about some of these harder to measure, uncertain, more unpredictable aspects that might be occurring um, with, within the systems in which we set policies. And this is really what we've been doing over the, uh, over the most recent a uh, couple of years to really be able to pin that down and get a better understanding on how we can go about evaluating that. And the first part of that um, is actually around developing what is called the complexity evaluation framework, which I will hand over to my colleague Simon Trimpton to talk us through now. Brilliant. Thank you, Taryn. Um... Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, so the work which arose from uh, that requirement was the Complexity Evaluation Framework, or what we've come to call the CEF. Um, so the development for of the CEF was contracted to the Centre for the Evaluation of Complexity Across the Nexus, who, as Taryn said earlier, we were working with at the time on a number of different uh, a number of different sets of work around complexity. Um, the development of the CEF drew upon evidence from a variety of different sources, both existing and new. So at the time, uh, CCAM were developing a complexity annex for the Magenta book, which has now been published. Um, and knowledge from that was drawn in to ensure that the CEF would align with that annex for the Magenta book. Uh, there were a series of literature and resources which CCAM had developed around complexity, uh, which are still accessible. Um, there were, at the time, a number of different CCAN fellowships and learning exercises which were being undertaken in DEFRA, and there was a systems mapping case study that was concurrently undertaken from which we drew learning as well. Uh, there was also some new evidence that we gathered um, just through the development of the CEF. So there was a rapid evidence review that looked at DEFRA specific policy domains and a series of specific evaluation focused journals. Um, there were a number of interviews which were undertaken with target users and stakeholders, both within core DEFRA and across a number of our arm's length bodies as well. And there were some workshops with potential users and stakeholders to test an early draft of the complexity evaluation framework. So at the end of all of that, what we had was a A3 visual poster, which we call part one of the CEF, and an accompanying evidence report, which we call part two, which had further details on considerations and the guidance. So the CEF is designed to be used as a flexible, iterative tool when undertaking or managing evaluations throughout their, the entirety of their life cycle. Um, it aims to provide a shared language that analysts and policymakers can use when reviewing evaluation approaches, facilitating discussion with policy stakeholders um, and with policy colleagues and stakeholders around complexity. It provides a cross check to allow us to quality assure evaluation approaches. It provides a prompt for developing all different sorts of ideas uh, and when considering complexity across the policy development cycle. Uh, and also it provides sort of a, a central point for resources for learning around complexity. Um, so what we're going to do now is just give you a quick look at what the CEF actually contains. So part one of the CEF uh, aims to define complexity and help users to recognize if the system in which they're operating is complex and how. So what it does is it explains that a system or process is made up of a range of diverse components, such as people or organisms, that interact in nonlinear ways, and that those interactions may further adapt over time. Um, it also explains that complexity might be in both the system in which the policy is taking place and within the policy itself. So there might be multiple actors or multiple actions that are occurring there. Um, so the policy evaluation itself. Um, the CEF presents complexity characteristics to reflect upon and to help diagnose complexity. So those characteristics are presented with examples, specifically those relevant to environmental policy or DEFRA's remit. Um, for example, uh, as you can see on the screen, the CEF presents feedback as a potential complex issue, which is demonstrated by the outcomes of climate change. So you can see an example is given of permafrost melting that releases more greenhouse gases, contributing further to climate change, which is a positive feedback loop. The second part of the CEF lays out questions and considerations around complexity within five phases of an evaluation project cycle, uh, as shown um, 
in the uh, picture to the right of the screen. Um, so the sharp eyed among you might be able to see that there's a bit of a yin yang pattern which is occurring there. Uh, and that shows that um, the phases are intended to be iteratively um, and they all sort of feed and, and mix together. So to run through them quickly, there's the evaluation purpose, which is the focus of the evaluation. Uh, there are understanding and designing phases, which lay out the context of an approach to evaluation. There's the embedding phase, which sets out the importance of incorporating stakeholders, um, dissemination and accounting for ongoing change. And there's also a managing section, which highlights the iterative nature of the evaluation process. So as I mentioned before, and the yin yang diagram sort of uh, illustrates, all of those phases overlap. So the understanding around the evaluation will continue to evolve throughout that evaluation. Um, so our evaluation purpose may adapt and change due to internal or external pressures. And as a result, that might alter the ways in which the evaluation is embedded or knowledge is disseminated throughout the evaluation itself. Um, some of the core things that we have discovered and really form the center of the learning from the CEF are that evaluation plays a part of ongoing policy delivery, and that's really important. Evaluation should be developmental and adaptive. It's important to incorporate stakeholders um, and participatory approaches in order to understand complexity. Um, stakeholders can share a lot of um, interesting insights into the complexity itself and how it can be dealt with and how it's manifesting itself. Um, and also the importance of uh, considering dissemination. So having an awareness of the system and the caveats around that. So following that initial publication of the CEF in 2019, we moved on to evaluate the use of the tool itself. So being evaluators, we love evaluating. So we love evaluating our own tool. Um, so within the team, uh, what we've been able to use the CEF to do is to have open conversations with teams and to diagnose complexity. We're able to prompt examination or refinement of evaluation methods, and we're able to review considerations and options. So it was really important that we didn't push particular methods. Um, we didn't prescribe the use of all or even parts of the CEF, but we used the tool as a resource to engage and help teams to see if and how complexity is relevant to their area of work. Then we supported teams to work through the issues arising from complexity and build more complexity aware, robust evaluation approaches. So some of the, um, some of the early impacts uh, of the CEF were that users felt they were able to more clearly articulate complexity. Um, they took a more holistic approach to evaluations. So they thought about the bigger picture and sort of independences. Um, they adopted more flexible stakeholder-led evaluation designs like developmental evaluation, um, and they better managed expectations around limitations in results. Um, some of the further outcomes of the CEF and how it's been used are supporting the critical review and development of evaluation plans. So it's been really useful in responding to things like shared outcomes fund bids. It's been used as a basis for handling unanticipated complexity in evaluations. So it formed the basis of our internal COVID-19 evaluation guidance. Um, it's been used to sort of develop our internal evaluation training offer. So thinking about those parts in the cycle where people were really struggling. Um, it's been cited in the uh, Magenta book, so the, no the most recent version, as an example of good practice in the complexity annex. It's been referred to in tenders to guide external contractors. Um, it's been used by uh, and we've engaged with arm's length bodies in their evaluations, and it's informed further practical tools. So what I'll do now is pass across to my colleague Layla, who will give an example of how the CEF was used and some of our next steps. Are you there, Layla? Apologies, I'm on mute. Ah, very good. Uh, I'm yeah, always same. doing that. No worries. <laughs> so as Simon said, um, this is a bit of a case study example of um, how one of the teams in DEFRA made use of the CEF. Um, this is a team that was supporting a regulation system in the, and in the very early stages of designing an evaluation. And they're still thinking about the sort of methodological options and um, who needed to be involved as well. 
So this is this in this example, this, the team used the SEF to both explore and consider complexity, so that part one, and also reflect on how to account for it in the evaluation approach as well. So some of the ways in which the SEF was used here was in identifying complexity. Um, and so part of that in this context was recognising there might be adaption um, to the regulation, businesses changing their behaviour as a result um, over time. Um, and that really helps the team to shape evaluation questions and consider what some of the data um, strands and considerations might be. Um, reflecting on some of the recommendations from the SEF around participatory approaches um, supported the team as well to bring in wider stakeholders and really help develop some of the core aims and research questions to align with um, wider stakeholder needs. And that also served as well to manage expectations around what some of the results might be and, and their, uh, their sort of wider applicability. Um, I'd also add that um, as the CEF is a, is, a, is a tangible tool, the team were also able to refer to it and use it in their invitation to tender when they commissioned out the evaluation. So helping to embed sort of principles of complexity awareness in, in contractor approaches as well. So um, I, I'm moving us along along the timeline. Um, so as was sort of drawn out in that example, the CEF really highlights the importance of understanding the context and the system which a, which um, a policy is working in to understand impact and evidence it. Um, and part of that um, sort of naturally points to the importance of theory of change. Um, and the CEF um, specifically highlights um, the importance of theory and cha of change theory of change that incorporates that systems knowledge and is revisited and considered over time. Uh, theory of change is also something that's more broadly recognised as being valuable for supporting policy and evidence development. Um, we can see that reflected in uh, the last spending review and in outcome delivery plan templates where theories of change have been specifically required and there's um, real value put in setting out that clear narrative for why policy activities um, are, in, uh, are expected to lead to our intended outcomes and, and impacts. Um, from a complexity perspective and a DEFRA perspective, though um, traditional models for theory of change can be quite linear um, and sort of recognising that and building on the recommendations from the CEF and our experience using it, um, we realised that evidence, our evidence might be further supported um, with a bespoke practical theory of change tool that really took into account um, that wider systems thinking and complexity awareness. Um, and oh, I'll move the slide along. Um, and so that's um, what prompted the commission um, last year for a bespoke uh, theory of change tool for DEFRA. So the core aims of, of that commission to support both analytical and policy leads in developing complexity aware theory of change, um, providing clear accounts of how environmental outcomes uh, environmental policies deliver outcomes, really building in the, uh, the principles of the public value framework um, and further enabling that robust um, policy evaluation um, and building in complexity um, considerations. So as sort of indicated in the in the in the diagram on the right hand side, the concept is that the, the tool can really support um, teams to establish the policy narrative, setting out the aims, um, types of impacts, and also interdependencies and assumptions that you expect to see in a theory of change, and further building in um, systems knowledge to that context, and highlighting um, where there are complexities, where aspects might be subject to change or quite uncertain, um, and, uh, and together that forming a framework for developing key metrics and evidence and um, support for reviewing those over time as well. Um, in terms of the approach that we've taken for developing that practical tool, um, we commissioned um, Contractors Technopolis, partnered with, uh, the, uh, with CCAN, um, to, to develop this tool from January this year to be delivered um, sort of early July. The approach you've taken is, um, is quite, it, it, it takes on some of the principles of um, the CEF as well in itself. Um, we take it takes quite an iterative and participatory approach to really um, work with teams to inductively um, develop a tool that's really practical and relevant for um, for DEFRA. 
So alongside a critical literature review and scoping exercise, sort of core of the research um, is based on theory of change workshops that are undertaken with DEFRA teams. So these were taken with undertaken with a range of policy areas, um, policies with various sort of levels of maturity of theory of change, and the approach was adjusted and flexed depending on the context um, and needs and to test different ways of communicating complexity issues and sort of forms of theory of change as well. So currently um, the tool is still in development and we're expecting a draft, a first draft soon, which we're very excited about. Um, and from there we'll be testing it again um, with internal stakeholders and teams um, to get ourselves to a refined version to further support teams in the run up to um, the upcoming spending review. So uh, that yeah, that was a sort of whistle stop tour of DEFRA's approach and journey over the last couple of years to handling the challenges and opportunities of um, implementing complexity aware evaluation. Um, so yeah, the journey through from developing the complexity evaluation framework, um, the experience and learning from implementing and evaluating it um, to our current commission to developing a DEFRA theory of change tool. Um, and I'll leave it there and we're happy to answer any questions in the section later. Thank you. Leila, uh, Simon, Taryn, thanks very much uh, for that. That's really helpful. So setting out there really how you think about the framework for uh, uh, complex uh, analysis uh, as part of it. Some people are doing a very clever applause. Uh, that's very good. Um, so thank you for that. And as I say, we're going to, as Leila says at the end there, we're going to Come back with questions um, uh, at the end once we've heard all four presentations. I'm conscious we've probably got about 50 or 60 people who've joined since we started. So can I remind people to, uh, if you've got questions or what thoughts you want to share, please put them into the chat and feel free to start doing that now. And then we'll pick them up and put them to the panel once we've had uh, all four presentations. But now we're going to move on from the sort of thing about the framework for evaluation to actually Thinking about a particular uh, example and we've got Claire and Matt with us from uh, DWP uh, who are going to talk to us about DWP's producing parental conflict program. Claire can I hand to you? Sure thank you very much hopefully you can see my screen if someone could just confirm you can see my screen that would be great. Yes. Fabulous okay so um it's great to be here. My name is Claire Wardman. I'm a social researcher at the Department for Work and Pensions um, and I work in the interparental relationship analysis team. And what Matt and I, my colleague Matt and I are going to talk to you about is both uh, an evaluation that could be considered complex and a policy that could be considered complex. They're not particularly, it's not a com particularly conceptually difficult policy or evaluation it's quite easy to understand what we're trying to achieve but it's been quite challenging to deliver for lots of different reasons so hopefully as we go through some of the challenges that we talked to you about will be familiar and some of them may be not so familiar and they might just give you some tips and pointers for how to deal with them if you come across them so today what I'm going to do is talk about the reducing parental conflict policy context and then the programme and then some of the challenges that we've encountered uh, dealing with each of the different strands of the evaluation. And then hopefully we'll wrap up with a couple of sort of tips and lessons that we've learned. So if I can just move the slides on, there we go. So in terms of the policy context, as I said, it's not particularly difficult to get your head around what the policy is trying to do. So there's a sort of growing and mature body of evidence that parental conflict that is sustained and poorly resolved impacts detrimentally on children's outcomes. So it impacts on all of a, a, a huge range of their outcomes, so psychological, social, and then going through into adulthood, it impacts on any on their kind of financial outcomes as well. So here we're talking about parental conflict that's at a level that's below domestic abuse. So Although there's a growing body of evidence and mature evidence about the impact of uh, parental conflict, um, it's quite a new policy area. So domestic abuse has kind of got an established policy. It's quite got a long quite tradition, whereas domestic, sorry, parental conflict is sort of a new policy area. So we're talking about parental conflict where people are struggling to communicate, but there isn't any fear between the partners. So. It's an early intervention sort of uh, approach. It's an investor save um, policy 
because the poor outcomes lead to cost to individuals and society. So what we want to do is intervene earlier to prevent poor outcomes. So the programme itself has got three different strands and the evaluation has three strands to sort of marry up to those pro to the programme strands as well. So we're testing out um, the delivery of eight different interventions, which are basically relationship support interventions that we offer to parents. And it's a great um, example of evidence informed policy, because what we're doing is we're testing eight different interventions that have got promising evidence bases that they do work, but not necessarily in the UK context or for the cohorts of parents that we're interested in. So what we're doing is we're trialing them in a UK context. And that's the kind of evidence that we're seeking to gather is how they work for a UK cohort of parents. So we, the, the other sort of interesting thing about um, the intervention delivery is that the rigorous collection and transfer of evidence and data has been built into the process. So analysts were involved at the time at which the programme was being designed. And what's, what they've come up with is something that Matt might talk a little bit about um, as a referral stage questionnaire, which is a kind of patchwork of various different uh, assessment tools who, which have been academically assessed and approved. So it identifies the level of conflict that parents are, are experiencing, but it also means that that, that data capture is uh, part of the backbone of our evaluation, actually. So the data is fed back into the department on a regular basis. So we get baseline data and then we collect the same data at different points in the parents' journeys. So the second strand of work that the programme entails is uh, training for practitioners. So there's two different types of training, really. There's one type of training, which is a, almost like a universal offer of training, which is about raising awareness of uh, the detrimental impacts of parental conflict on children. And it sort of ramps up to uh, that training ramps up to giving tools and resources for people to, dele to deal with parents that they might encounter who are experiencing conflict. So that's one aspect of the training, which was delivered. It's been developed for the programme, it's bespoke for the programme. The other aspect of training that we're uh, hoping to launch soon is about upskilling uh, practitioners to actually deliver the interventions themselves to parents. The final strand of the evaluation, the third strand of the evaluation is about local integration. So I mentioned that it's an early intervention, invest to save type policy, and it, we really feel that it sits best with local authorities. So what we're trying to do as a Department of Work and Pensions is try and get local authorities um, to build their capacity and their knowledge so that they can take on the sort of mantle of, of addressing parental conflict. So how we've done that is we've got some regional sort of champions in place called the Regional Integration Leads, and they are they sort of share evidence and knowledge and galvanise activity around this, around parental conflict. And we've also given grant money out to local authorities so that they can use it to address parental conflict however they think is best in their local area, recognising that different areas are at different um, parts of their journey, different uh, levels of journey. So this slide is really just to show that um, it's been it's a really complicated uh, evaluation and program for lots of different reasons. So we've got an impact and process evaluation. We've got an internal and, ed and external evaluation. So I just manage the external evaluation, but the external evaluation is gathering data for the internal impact evaluation. There's multiple stakeholders, so local authorities, commissioners, academics, um, policymakers across Whitehall, so Ministry of Justice, Department of Education, Public Health England, there's lots of different interest in the evaluation and the policy. We've got multiple research targets and it's multi-method. So although you probably can't read that thumbnail sort of table that's in the corner of the slides, that's just to show you the kind of, they're, they're all different data collections that are going on as part of the evaluation. So each line in there is a different data collection exercise that's part of just the external evaluation. And then there's the internal evaluation as well. And it's going on for multiple years, so it was commissioned in 2018 and we've had a successful spending review bid, so we are now extending the programme till 2023. And there's multiple dis multidisciplinary interest in this. So there's interest in this across not just multidisciplinary, but also across um, in the US. They're kind of interested in what we're doing as well, just as we were interested in what they were doing in the US. Um, so 
when I say it's multidisciplinary interest, obviously Matt and myself are social researchers, but the impact assessment is being delivered by economists working closely with statisticians. So um, thinking about the impact assessment, Matt, I, if it's all right with you, I'll go over to you so that you can talk a little bit about the challenges we've had with that. Yep. Cool. Thanks, Claire. Um, so, yes, I'm Matt Garlick. I lead a team in DWP exploring uh, interparental relationships as part of our kind of family uh, family policy analysis. And I work quite heavily with Claire on the RPC evaluation. So I just thought I'd give a, a short contribution from me on the impact evaluation. Um, I guess one of our biggest challenges um, has and continues to be keeping the impact evaluation on track. Um, I won't explain the detailed design today, uh, but it's basically a before and after non-experimental design. So we don't have a control group. And as, as Care uh, alluded to earlier, the evaluation relies on asking parents to complete questionnaires and participate in surveys before and after participation in an RPC intervention. So we simply compare their answers to assess whether conflict has reduced and if the behaviour of the children in those families has improved following the intervention. Um, we've got rather an elaborate system for collecting all the questionnaires and merging them into one evaluation da database. So we've got various checks in place to make sure that this process is working properly. And um, yeah, a, a classic challenge on any policy or programme evaluation involving thousands of people is, is the data completeness and integrity. And in this uh, programme, as this slide shows, there are many points at which participants can be can be lost and their data is lost as well. Um, so these these points of these potential points of loss, uh, they all represent risks to the impact evaluation that must be monitored and addressed as appropriate. So if you follow the process from left to right, I'll explain the key steps. Please note that the, uh, the numbers here are illustrative. I can't share the real figures today, um, but yeah, some of the proportions are around about right. Um, but let's just pretend that we've managed to get about 5,000 referrals to RPC interventions, but around 35, 37% uh, of parents referred have failed to start the intervention. So um, that 5,000 drops immediately to just over 3,000 starts. Now, thankfully, we're monitoring the referral to start ratio at contract level and we're working with the providers to improve parent engagement um, and building in further stretch, aiming for an 85% conversion rate as part of the forthcoming contract and programme extension. Um, sadly, we don't receive an initial assessment questionnaire from everybody that starts. Now, there are valid reasons why this, this can happen. For example, this a uh, particular questionnaire focuses on child behaviour and well-being, uh, but uh, you can't really answer the questions if the child is under two. Um, so we're currently checking the data to identify these valid nulls and preparing to work with the contract managers to improve data collection. Uh, likewise with participation, just under half of the parents who start an intervention fail to complete it. And of those who complete an intervention, around 40% currently fail to complete their post-assessment questionnaire. Now, again, there are sometimes good reasons for this, but basically not having data, for, data points for everybody post-intervention is a missed opportunity. And um, I think a 60% completion rate is pretty poor. So again, we're, we're working with the providers to improve this. Um, Finally, we've got a commissioned research company to conduct a survey around uh, four to six months after the parent completes an intervention. Um, even though they're achieving what I think is a really good response rate of around 40%, this means that 60% of our results are lost to the evaluation. And this is the first point post-intervention that we measure changes in child behaviour. Um, so this survey is crucial in assessing what the main aim of the programme is, and that's to improve child outcomes. So how are we getting around this? Well, um, uh, provided there's no systematic differences between the parents who completed the programme and those who responded or failed to respond to the follow-up survey, um, we can use intention to treat analysis where we assume uh, that the parents who failed to respond to the survey answered in a similar way to those who did. Um, so the missing 60% is not necessarily a complete disaster for us. 
Um, however, overall, you can see that we're losing participants uh, along the way and uh, losing their data left, right and centre. So it is going to be tricky. Uh, throw in the kind of annoying fact that we've had about a third of the volume of referrals that we expected. And we're trying to estimate impacts for eight different interventions. Um, and unfortunately, for the interventions receiving uh, the lowest number of referrals, we might only uh, survey at the end point um, somewhere around kind of maybe less than 50 parents. And then on top of this, <laughs> as if it can't get any worse, um, we analysed the results at couple level only. So take 50 parents, obviously that might only be, uh, might only give us 25 couples to analyse for some interventions. Um, but that's the kind of worst case scenario. So as you see, there's, there's much more to this strand of the evaluation than the volumes of referral going in at the front end. Um, and I must admit, um, having previously run trials uh, where I've aimed to get, you know, hundreds or even thousands of people through through a program or intervention to completion. I was kind of shocked by the emerging stats uh, that I was finding when I when I joined this program, and wondered, you know, how on earth are we going to pull this off? Um, so, yeah, uh, firstly, how are we monitoring all these risks? Well, we've developed or we're in the process of developing an MI pack and dashboard to monitor all these referrals and starts and the various um, attrition rates uh, so that we can see where these risks are materialising. And um, I think the main take home point for anybody running a trial or collecting evaluation data from a wide range of stakeholders is just don't don't sit back and expect the data to roll in. You, you can kind of guarantee that um, for people who are participating in the programme or the practitioners delivering it, collecting accurate data for you as an analyst, it just won't be their top priority at all. They'll be focused on the on the customers or whatever. Um, so my advice is like, get out there and monitor like crazy. Um, visit every site possible and sit with the people entering the data at the front end. Uh, when you see people making mistakes by putting data in the wrong boxes, and taking little shortcuts as people inevitably do, uh, consider excluding their data from the analysis and assume that everybody else is doing it as well. So you can get a message out there to clarify the guidance or whatever's necessary to solve the problem. Uh, basically, you've got to be, you know, if, if you're a bit OCD or a bit of a control freak, this is kind of paradise, really. Get all over the data and in the nicest way possible, kind of pester people to death. Um, so I've, you know, I've previously, not on this project, but I found myself out, out in job centres, sniffing out job centres in the roughest parts of Manchester, and rummaging through paperwork in uh, in call centres in on a foggy day in Stranra and stuff like that. So, so monitoring compliance is as important as doing the analysis itself. And uh, I think this this uh, this program, this evaluation, is no different to that. So back to Claire. Thanks, Matt. Um, so in the interest of time, I'm not going to labour the point on this one too much, but basically what I wanted to say about the training strand of research and the policy is that the training research went really well um, in terms of the delicate experience. So we had a pre-survey and a post-survey, so not a pre-survey and a post-survey, sorry, a survey immediately after training had been undertaken and a survey six months later to pick up whether uh, delegates on the training had been able to apply their training. We also had some qualitative work with those and that worked really well and went really smoothly. When coronavirus came along and switched and, and forced us to switch all of the delivery to remote delivery rather than being classroom based, we reran the survey with delegates, we reignited the survey so that we could check that the switch to remote delivery hadn't impacted detrimentally on the delegate experience and that went perfectly well. However, you'll recall I mentioned there was another type of training uh, that we're also offering through the pro programme, which is to um, upskill relationship support professionals themselves to deliver interventions. And it doesn't really matter why, I guess, in terms of uh, what, what I'm about to say, but the planned launch date was November 2019 for that training and it just didn't happen. Essentially, it didn't happen because the, we hadn't thought of a way of getting the money, the grant money out to local authorities. So there was a lot of work undertaken between uh, 
November and March to try and redesign um, the, the, the process for getting the money out. Um, and that change in focus meant that the survey that we had planned in the initial evaluation was no longer suitable. So we had to think about that because doing a delegate survey then didn't make sense. So we revised our plans to focus on more strategic outcomes because that was what the policy intent was to increase the supply of uh, practitioners who could support parents in the local area. Um, but then what we what they wanted to measure was the wholesale change in the supply and delivery and the market uh, six months after a policy was rolled out, which again was pretty challenging. So I think I'm probably the only person who's going to say that coronavirus happening was actually quite healthy, helpful for us. Not exactly coronavirus, but the pause in uh, the project that it gave us. And it meant that the policy never actually started in March 2020 as it was supposed to. Following that failure to start, or in between time, sorry, we, we did, had a successful spending review bid, which has meant that we've now got more money. And so we've got more money in that grant, which means we can do more things with it. And we don't have to do a competitive tender process, which is what we were going to have to do before. So actually, that paused rollout has meant that we, we have time to think and consider what's the best way of getting the data and evidence we need. Uh, at the, right now, it's not been launched, but we're we're uh, optimistic it should be launched sometime soon, probably next week. So I guess the learning point for us was that we had to live with sort of nine months of uncertainty and not knowing what was going to happen. And so it's, it was quite challenging to live with that kind of ambiguity, both for us and for our colleagues who knew that we had this money to do some evaluative work, but we weren't actually doing anything. What we've been able to do now is make sure that there's some MI requirements built into the sort of bidding process and the the application process so that we'll get a certain standard of data which will fill an evidence need and we're free to do something more strategic with the evaluation money and I won't go into all the contractual issues it, it left for me as project manager managing the external contractor but it, it was needless to say it was a bit of a nightmare has been a bit of a nightmare final thing from us then on the final strand our final strand is on local integration so this was intended to be a test and learn program with lots of sharing of what works with local areas to facilitate their sustained integration into local services but what we came up against and continue to come up against is a misunderstanding that the evaluation would be delivering that kind of action research that's needed for live running of a program. So the requests for us to share evidence keep on coming. And it's not that we're being mean and sitting on evidence. It's that our evidence is partial at the moment. Evaluation takes time. We want to deliver a robust assessment of the merit of a policy and be really clear about that. And it's we've had numerous challenges in that regard. We don't have the luxury of being able to share interim or incomplete findings because they may be misleading or plain wrong. So um, we've, we've come up against a bit of a challenge and an issue here in that we've had a marked drop in response rates from our local authorities this year. And we're not sure if it's to do with coronavirus or lost goodwill because we haven't actually been able to feed anything back to them. But either way, the main quantitative measure of our local integration uh, progress has been challenged uh, or compromised so we switched to telephone we switched an online survey to telephone completion but that only led to an additional 20 or so surveys coming in so we consulted with stakeholders about what was going on and it's become apparent that the main reason why we weren't getting the surveys in is not to do with coronavirus or even a lack of will because of um, lack of feedback. It's more to do with the fact that the people that we're surveying don't have a corporate memory and don't have the responsibility or the knowledge to answer the questions that we've been asking about what's changed over the past year. And I guess that's the finding for us. So the messages from, from us or the lessons that we've learned is about being clear about what, what will be available when and not to waver, but also to work with customers and stakeholders on what they do need. And it's, it's OK to work with them on what they need for live running, but and also to manage their expectations that the evaluation isn't going to deliver that. And also just to be mindful that you can try different approaches. Um, not everything will work and if it doesn't work it's fine just document that as a finding for others to learn from so oh last one I'm sort of finishing where I started so just from our experience I think it, we've certainly learned to plan that plans won't always go to plan that best laid plans don't always come to fruition so 
we've learned to be flexible and not doggedly pursue stuff just for the sake of it. I think we've learned to switch things up a bit. So when volumes aren't when volumes are lower than anticipated, it's tempting just to go, oh, we'll switch to quality. But we can, we've can. we been looking at what different weighting can be done, what different kind of statistical techniques we can use. And I guess we've learned to be solution focused. We're now on contract variation three because we identified some gaps in the original evaluation plan. So and that's fine. We're responding to what, what's needed. I guess involving your stakeholders is another critical thing. So it would, if we hadn't have involved the stakeholders in understanding why our local authority survey response rate was so low, we still wouldn't know. We might think it's an issue with the survey or coronavirus or something different. Um, be honest about what you can and can't deliver. It doesn't serve any. It doesn't serve you any good or anyone else any good if you don't be honest about that. I've certainly learned to be the defender of the evaluation. So there's been numerous times when the evaluate people have wanted to tweak things in tracking surveys, etc., which would have just compromised the validity. So it's just really important to make make sure that you maintain the integrity of the evaluation. And the final and most important thing is just to keep perspective that things don't always go to plan, but it's not your fault as the project manager. And I'll stop there and hand back over. Thank you, Claire. Uh, thank you, Matt, uh, for that presentation. Um, and I see some people uh, mentioned in the chat uh, sort of comforting to sort of think that uh, on these complex evaluations, things don't always go to plan, but you can actually uh, manage it and get some useful insights. Now, there are a number of very specific questions about uh, your work, Claire and Matt. And so you might want to have a quick look at those uh, in the in the chat. And thanks to everyone for putting uh, questions into the chat. So questions around sort of how do you work with, without comparison groups? How do you work out what factors drove uh, some of these changes? And then maybe when we come to the discussion, I might just come to you first on some of those. So you might want to just have a quick look at those to think about how you might answer them when we get there. But for now, I'll go to the next two uh, presentations that we've got before we come to that panel discussion. Uh, so we've had a sort of approach to complex evaluation more generally, then a very specific example on reducing parental conflict. And uh, next, we've got Samaya from the Cabinet Office on the new evaluation task force. Samaya, can I hand to you, please? Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. I, I've shared. Is it showing on your screen? It is. Thank you very much. Oh, brilliant. OK, so let's get started. So hi, everyone. I'm Samaya. I work in the What Works team in the Prime Minister's Implementation Unit, which is part of the Cabinet Office, which will be moving into the Evaluation Task Force, which is what I'm here to speak to you about. So um, before I tell you about what we're going to be doing, hopefully, um, I think it's probably helpful to give a bit of context about how we got here. And I think John sort of alluded to some of that at the beginning um, of the presentation, and some of the presenters have also sort of said a few things as well. So um, as you're probably all aware, there has been a big focus on evaluation over the past perhaps year and a half. Um, most notably, we've had, um, so we've had SR. So in Budget 2020, we had a commitment to, to use SR to um, ensure that government programmes are delivering for the public and making sure that spending decisions are based on robust evidence and also evaluation of impact. Um, we've also I've got an ex a quote here from the SR letter itself um, of the ask that we that we gave to departments. So we in SR 20 we asked departments to provide a detailed overview of their evidence base and evaluation plans, and with the aim of informing a step change in the scale and quality of evaluation across government, which is what we're hoping to achieve through the various um, things I'll probably hopefully speak to you about a bit later on. And um, we've also had um, the likes of Michael Gove um, speaking about evaluation. So for anyone who watched the Ditchley lecture back in June 2020 um, would have heard his speech where he highlighted the lack of robust evaluation taking place um, in government and sort of the real need to focus on what works and understanding whether we're sort of we're, whether, whether our activity is doing what it intends to do. Um, he highlighted in that speech um, findings from a cross-government evaluation review that my team and alongside HMT did back in 2019, which found that only 8% of 432 billion um, pounds worth of pro major projects expenditure had robust evaluation plans in place. Um, actually, in the speech, if anyone watched it, he actually, I think, if I remember correctly, highlighted as some specific programmes that he was overseeing as education minister that perhaps could have done a bit more in terms of understanding what works. So we've had ministers like Michael Gove really highlighted this, both within government, but also um, publicly. 
Um, we've also got it mentioned sort of in the Conver Conservative Manifesto um, with the uh, intention to sort of improve the use of data, data science and also evidence. Um, the PM has also written to Secretary of State asking them to thoroughly evaluate the impact of all policies and programmes um, and a similar sort of letter, uh, a joint um, Prime Minister and Chancellor letter um, on project delivery asking departments to ensure that findings from evaluation is informing decisions on whether projects should be sort of modified, scaled up, continued or, or, or actually ending because they're, they're not producing the findings that we're looking for. So this is just a bit of context to show the sorts of things that have been happening before the evaluation task force sort of um, came about or is coming about rather um, and the sort of um, the focus that is had not just from um, civil servants in government but also from ministers so this is this has really been a big focus over the past year and a half and it, this has cul culminated into this announcement um, at spending review which announced um, the evaluation task force which will be a joint cabin office HMT unit reporting to both um, both cabin office and HMT ministers so really at the centre and um, bringing both two departments together on this agenda. So we've got a quote here of what it, of, of the announcement in, in Spending Review 2020. Um, so the aim here is um, to ensure that um, we're really delivering for citizens and we're really incorporating it into um, spending decisions. So um, perhaps I should tell you a bit more about what are the aims and objectives of the evaluation task force are and what we're hoping to achieve. It's probably worth um, sort of caveating some of that just to say we are in the process of setting up the team. So a lot of this is our sort of intention and we'll be um, working through that and prior prioritising. But we wanted, I wanted to give you a bit of a flavour of, of what we're looking to do and sort of how you can engage with us um, in, the, in the coming months um, and hopefully in the lead up to, lead up to SR. So um, the ETF intends, as, as everything that we do in government, to improve people's lives um, by, in by ensuring robust evidence on the effectiveness of policies and programmes sits at the heart of spending decisions, but also operational decisions. And its purpose is sort of three-pronged, and the first being around just sort of what I said in terms of informing decisions on whether programmes should be stopped, continued, whether we should be scaling these up or whether we should be um, modifying these um, and to ensure that um, all government programmes are being evaluated in a way to help us make those decisions. Secondly, um, we're, we're really keen to ensure that we're supporting departments um, and supporting them to conduct programme evaluations that are not just robust but also proportionate. So we're, we're fully aware that not every programme can do a randomised control trial, for instance, um, and may need to do something slightly different. So we want to be supporting departments to identify what's the best method that they can be using for that programme in question to understand its effectiveness. And we've been doing some, some of that work already, so we'll be continuing that, and I can talk a little bit about that today. And then finally, I think, and perhaps most importantly, is really empower analysts like yourselves who are in departments who are already pushing this agenda. We know we're not the first. We know you've all sort of been doing that for however long you've been here um, and really pushing the agenda for evaluation. So we're here to empower you as much as we can to play a central role in the design of programmes, but also in the in the decisions and surrounding it around spending and operation. And it's probably worth mentioning that um, in the in the lead up to all of this in terms of both the work that we've done at SR but also in terms of setting up the this team the task force and designing its um, program of work and its blueprint we've been working quite closely with analysts um, for instance directors of analysis and also the evaluation community to ensure that we're doing the best that we can to help you continue doing what you're doing essentially uh, um, and really strengthen that as much as possible so that's sort of our our intention and our purpose in terms of our act activities, um, I've got six boxes here, but it actually fits broadly more into three. Um, so firstly, um, it's uh, our sort of activity we'll, we'll be engaging in is around scrutiny. So more of a continuation of what we did at SR. So at SR, we asked departments to provide us with information on the evidence and evaluation plans for each sort of line of spend. And we, um, we had a look at that and we, um, and we provided sort of recommendations to spending teams um, and advice to departments on how they can improve that. So we're, we're, we're hoping to continue that work. So we'll be doing sort of um, rapid scrutiny of evaluation plans that are submitted, submitted to um, HMT via business cases or if um, they receive business cases with no, with no evaluation plans, we're looking to support spending teams, advise them on what evaluation that departments perhaps could be doing um, and that would be feasible and proportionate and providing um, spending teams with that knowledge and that expertise. 
Um, we're also quite conscious that previously in the past, HMT um, might not have been able to follow up on specific spending conditions, for instance, in relation to this to evidence or evaluation. So we're hoping to fill that fill that gap and invest and help with the sort of tracking and delivery of, of evaluations. So working with departments to see how evaluations are progressing, whether there's anything we can be doing to um, to sort of unblock or if there's um, certain things that, um, that need to be sort of dealt with. Um, and looking at any of the emerging results that are coming out of these evaluations and ensuring they're being fed back into decisions that are made both by departments but also by um, treasury spending teams as well. So that's sort of the sort of scrutiny sort of um, area. The second bucket is around supporting departments. So um, some of you might be aware that at the moment we currently do provide, the WhatWorks team in particular currently do provide support to departments via our What Works trial advice panel, and I'll leave sort of details of that a bit later on, um, which is a sort of panel of experts that provides advice to government teams. Um, and we're looking to continue that service um, as well as using our own sort of internal um, internal sort of specialists within the team to advise departments on the design on and delivery of robust proportionate evaluation, which will include a range of methods, ranging from sort of experimental methods to sort of quasi-experimental or more sort of theory-based evaluation where appropriate. Um, so we'll be continuing that support and working closely um, with departments um, on that and where needed. And finally, sort of, I guess it's the last three boxes here at the bottom, um, but the last three boxes around transparency. So this has been something um, that a lot of people have been raising both within departments, but also sort of in the center, um, um, the issue around transparency when it comes to sort of um, research and evaluation. So we're really keen to sort of push that as much as we can, especially where we've got the ministerial support um, we're really encouraged, uh, we're really uh, motivated to try and go as far as we can on this. So um, some of the things that we'll be doing is encouraging departments to have a uh, quote unquote open by default approach to the publication of programme data um, with the necessary safeguards, as of course that might not be possible for all programmes. Um, but the idea here, here is to enable the rapid evaluation of government programmes by uh, sort of external parties at little or no cost to government. So there's been examples of this um, actually quite recently, not something our team has specifically done, but I think HMT, for instance, has recently published um, data on ESAT to help out, which um, sort of people sort of outside of government use that data to do rapid evaluation at a time when the department perhaps was, wasn't able to do that due to obviously the current situation. So we're looking to encourage, um, in, encourage this sort of approach. We'll also be looking to um, maintain a register of evaluation plans and summaries and trial protocols um, in order to reduce publication bias. Um, and some of that is currently ho hoping will be done via the new sort of ODP process. So the outcome delivery plans, um, some, I think we've already been alluded to, but um, there's been requests in there to include information on um, evaluation plans for each priority outcome, which so, uh, some of which may be public. So uh, we're looking to sort of um, support that, but also um, develop a public register in due course. And finally, um, working with sort of GDS and Gov.uk to make evaluation results more sort of searchable and more accessible on um, online um, to increase the pressure to act on results um, that are being produced by evaluations. So that's sort of the transparency sort of area of work that we're looking to sort of get involved in and to push. Um, probably worth, again, I think I mentioned this earlier, we are, we are in the, still in the setup stage. So all of this activity, unfortunately, we won't be able to do all of this straight away, but there are some things that we will be focusing on. So in the next sort of six months, I thought it might be helpful to highlight the specific areas that we'll be um, prioritizing and working on. So the first is around embedding the use of evaluation findings in, in spending decisions. So we will, um, we've, we've just had SR20, so we will be doing a sort of tracking work to, and, and following up on some of the programs that we looked at SR20 to ensure sort of they're going okay and if there's any sort of uh, results making sure we're feeding that back to spending teams and, and intervening if there's if, if where we can to address any issues um, we'll also be um, tracking sort of a specific a specific priority areas so areas that HMT spending teams or ministers have, have identified as the um, areas where they consider perhaps the evidence is weak or something that they particularly think is important or, or priority for government we'll also be Following, uh, following up on uh, programs that are identified in the outcome delivery plans um, associated to their priority outcomes. And also, uh, uh, as you may be aware, departments have been asked to provide sort of five priority evidence gaps that they will, they will address through evaluation. 
um, as part of their SR20 sort of settlement. So we, we'll be um, working with departments on these evidence gaps and um, try if, if if and where, of course, we don't expect all of them to have evaluation results, but where 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 there are findings, we'll be you know looking at these and sharing them with spending teams or work with spending teams to ensure it's informing decisions. The other big chunk of work is around um, SR21. So we have another one coming up soon. So we'll be um, very much involved in designing and delivering SR21, and we're looking at the best way we can um, incorporate evaluation and evidence asks in that, and whether we need to sort of change our approach from last time. Um, and we'll be reviewing some of the things that we've put into SR20. So some departments, for instance, received central ring fence evaluation funding, um, and we'll be working with departments to understand um, whether this was an effective mechanism, whether this is something we should continue doing, whether it actually has unintended consequences. And so we'll be reviewing some of the things we did, we did at SR20. Um, also, directors of analysis were um, at SR given um, authority over evaluation spending. So we'll also be reviewing that to see if that's an effective mechanism um, and something we should be we should be continuing. And then finally, another area of work that we're particularly interested in is around innovation funds. So um, these funds are usually set up to understand what works, but um, of all public spending, they should, you know, we'd expect them to perhaps have the most robust evaluation. However, a, t a review that my team alongside again, HMT did back in 2019 found that only a third were being robustly evaluated, um, sort of accounted for around 3.6 um, billion of spend. Um, and a further one third had no impact evaluation. So we're really keen to make sure that these um, these funds are, are being set up in a way that they can enable robust evaluation and we'll be advising departments, advising teams on the design of these funds. Um, the review we, back, we did back in 2019 was really helpful in helping us understand what sort of features enable robust evaluation. So we'll be using that sort of intelligence that we've, we've gathered to advise departments where we can and we'll be working towards establishing sign-off authority on these to ensure that evaluation is embedded in early on um, to the design of these um, these funds. So that sort of um, program of work that we'll, we'll be looking to engage in, and obviously I have to take questions on this later. Um, I guess um, the, I guess I was trying to think of how, why is this important to why is this important to all of you in the audience? Um, and I I've been told majority of the people here are all analysts, which is great. So this is this none of this is uh, new to you in terms of understanding the importance of evaluation. I'm not going to beat that drum, but I guess. Um, what you can do is, is continue continue doing that, continue pushing for the robust proportionate evaluation in your departments, you know, speaking to your policy program colleagues um, and really um, hammer that hammer that home. Um, but also if you need if you need to if you need support making that case, point to us, point to the ministerial interest, point to the upcoming SR and the the importance of evaluation in the upcoming SR to help make your case. Again, we're here to support you. We're here to empower you as much as you can. So do engage with us. Um, again, worth mentioning, you know, again, uh, we are in the setup phase, so we are looking to, um, I'm looking for more people at the moment. It's just myself and the head of the team who will be starting very soon. Um, but we will have more people there to, to, to support you all. Um, one thing I will flag though, is that we do have, um, and I mentioned this briefly, is we do have um, a panel of experts who provide um, expert advice on evaluation. I think some of them are actually here today. And um, so we have a, mi a mixture of internal government experts, but also external experts who provide free advice to government teams who are looking to conduct an impact evaluation. So if you're if you're if you're currently at that stage and you want um, you need some expert advice, um, it can be a one off or we can we can have a long term engagement. Um, get in touch with either with me directly or you can use our trial advice panel email and get in touch and we'll, we're more than happy to support you and the final thing which is very timely that it happened today so today we've actually just had um sort of vacancies gone live for the evaluation task force so we're recruiting for two evaluation needs grade six and two senior evaluation advisors grade seven um deadline for application 6 april i can post the link in the, in the chat but if you are interested please do um please do apply please do share uh, and feel free to get in touch with me if you have any questions. So that was sort of a quick overview. Again, happy to take questions afterwards um, on, on this or anything related to it. Maya, thank you very much. That's a really great overview. And you've managed to advertise to a couple of hundred people there. So that's really good as well. we'll cut up, there are a couple of questions for you that I'll come back to at the end of the presentations. But I'm conscious we've got 20 minutes. So let's go straight into the next presentation. 
if that's okay, which is uh, Heidi from MOJ on the Prison Security Investment Programme. Heidi, can I hand to you, please? Hello. Uh, yes, absolutely. Can you see my screen? Yes, Heidi. Brilliant, thank you. Great. So, um, hello everyone. My name is Heidi Harris, and I'm a social researcher in the analytical director in uh, MOJ. So today I am going to be talking about the evaluation of the security investment program, which my team are conduct. So I want to highlight that we're quite early on in the evaluation, and therefore today I'm going to be focusing on where we are so far and some of the key challenges that we're already starting to face trying to evaluate such a large program of work in quite a complex environment. So I'm going to run through the first slides on background and aims fairly quickly and then spend a bit more time on methods and challenges. So firstly, the background of the programme itself. So towards the end of 2019, MOG received 100 million, uh, 100, yeah, sorry, 100 million to strengthen security and tackle uh, crime in prisons. The overall aim of the programme is to reduce crime in prisons that disrupt delivery of safe, decent and secure regimes and cause causes harm in the community. It includes several strands such as physical security measures, uh, things like x-ray body scanners, baggage scanners, trace detection, dogs, handheld wands and metal detection archways. New capability team and strategy to enhance and develop capability of staff in the security area. Implementation of a new counter corruption strategy focusing on the four key areas pursue, protect, prevent and prepare. Various digital intelligence projects to enhance capability capability in the intelligence area and finally MARSOC which is a strand to deliver a multi-agency response to serious and organised crime. So um, Treasury had two conditions for receiving this investment. Firstly that it had to be spent by the end of this financial year which gave the team just over a year to implement all of that I've just mentioned plus some additional strands that I've not mentioned um, and secondly that the programme had to be evaluated. So this slide just shows the four key aims for the evaluation worked up by the programme and Treasury. And as you can see, this includes delivery of the programme, the impacts and the financial kind of costs and benefits. So using that information, we developed a theory of change and decided on impact evaluation, process evaluation, economic evaluation in order to answer their questions and meet the Treasury condition. Um, I've included some of the key questions that we'll be looking to answer in this evaluation. So in order to develop a methodology, we're having regular meetings with all the different strand leads. And at this point, we realise that even though it's one programme, the strands within were being implemented individually. And by that, I mean they had different teams working on each strand and working to their own timetables throughout the year. There was a central point or is a central point even that it's all coming together. But in general, the implementation of one stand, strand doesn't necessarily rely on another. Um, so therefore, we kind of realised that we need to treat the evaluation in the same way. So producing a methodology for each of the strands, but just being so detailed methodology for each of the strands, but also just being very conscious of the overlap and what this might mean for the bigger picture. But also just utilising various data collection for multiple strands where possible, just making sure that we're reducing things like staff burden. So, for example, a lot of the same people um, that will be using for the participants in the physical security measure strands will be the same people in the staff capability strand as well. So we have developed detailed evaluation plans for each of the strands, um, but because of that, I don't really have the time to give you a clear picture of what's looking, what we're looking to implement under each strand exactly. But hopefully this table on slide five illustrates some of what we are thinking. So one of the things that we are keen to do in this evaluation is to use as many data avenues as possible to pull together a really strong narrative about the impacts it is having, but also to learn from the delivery of this programme. So we'll be triangulating data wherever possible so that each avenue supports, compares and contextualises with each other. <clears throat> So some of the approaches are utilising avenues that already exist. Um, so these are things like analysis of routinely collected metrics. We have access to data which recorded, which records incidences in prisons. Um, and these include such as things such as like fines of illicit items and um, things like assaults. We also have some bespoke data collections going um, ongoing for data that we would not have previously collected. So these are things like positive and negative scans of those being scammed by the security investment program, X-ray body scanners. We also are trying to utilize training feedback evaluation. 
so this program has required a lot of upskilling due to the additional staff being recruited and the new processes and equipment that's been put in place under this program so we're trying to use these forms to capture things like confidence and knowledge from staff carrying out these processes uh, the other one is analysis of intelligence data. So um, we collect intelligence data that gives us a really rich and detailed account of what's happening within the prison security space that we're hoping to utilise. Um, and finally, also just monitoring existing HMPPS surveys, um, which have elements of staff and offenders' perception of security and see if there's anything that can help there. Um, in addition to looking at the existing avenues, we're also looking to conduct some more primary research when we're allowed to go back and do that in prisons again. So this will be with frontline staff and offenders to further evidence the impact and delivery. Um, and this will hopefully be using methods such as depth interviews and various observation techniques. Um, I should also mention that because of the size of the program and that things do keep changing, we're also ensuring that we do continue to review the theory of change. We're also just finishing up a literature review on causes of violence and what works to reduce violence and contraband in prisons just to help our, inform our theory of change and contextualise our findings. We're hoping to report on interim findings next spring um, 22 and with a full report due spring 2023. So this is my final slide but definitely the longest um, and this is about some of the key challenges that we're facing. So with very we're still very much in the middle of all of this and I'm going to talk through how we're working through some of these issues and what we've done so far but if anyone does have any advice or have experienced working on a program similar um, I've already picked up on some stuff from the other presentations that have happened then I'm um, just very grateful to hear it. <coughs> So the first challenge is about rollout. So the evaluation was always due to follow the rollout of the programme, not the other way around. So as I mentioned at the beginning, there was a rather tight turnaround on the spending. This was a lot of money to spend in a really short time frame, which essentially means that there was no room for piloting or having much of an input on the rollout of the programme. It was a case that the programme leads just needed to get things implemented as soon as possible. So the decisions for rollout were more for efficiency purposes rather than what would work for a robust evaluation methodology. In terms of the evaluation and um, what we could do was quite there was quite little that we could do, but we did um, we asked to be kept in the loop and be given the opportunity wherever possible to come in on the rollout and see if there was something we could do for the evaluation. But mostly it was just staying up to date um, so we could generally utilise whatever spontaneously occurred in their rollout. This did work in our favour a little bit as we figured out quite early on that they would be using a staggered approach to implementation, which could potentially work with a more of a stepped wedge evaluation design. Um, so where all prisons will be receiving various interventions, hopefully there will be enough time and data between comparable prisons receiving the intervention and not having yet received the intervention. Um, and this is still on the cards for some of the strands. This kind of segues nicely onto my next point, which is thinking about the impact of the programme as a whole. So whilst we could use a step wedge design or something like it on, on the individual strands and perhaps on the more tangible strands, so these are things like the physical security measures like X-ray body scanners, this becomes a lot more difficult for the strands where the focus is more on recruiting the right people, getting them upskilled um, to the point that they're adding value and creating an implement sorry, creating and implementing new policies. Um, that's much more overarching and sits more at region level than kind of individual prison level. <clears throat> also, a staggered approach is not really going to be possible for looking at the programme's impact as a whole. This is because the programme overall results in a lot of variation of the interventions across the prison estate. Um, this has actually been further exacerbated by COVID as due to the delays, implementation for the programme is not going to be able to finish the original deadline, which is um, this financial year and it will be going into next financial year. What this has essentially means is that we're in a very complex situation where prison, prisons are receiving different interventions at different levels over a long period of time and not all of those interventions will actually sit at prison level as well. So this is probably the biggest challenge that we're facing as it will be really difficult to ascertain the impact of the programme as a whole. So what we're doing is considering more theory based impact evaluation and we're currently exploring this avenue with a range of experts to see if this programme would benefit from this particular approach. 
So another challenge that we're facing at the moment is the impact of COVID-19 on actually being able to conduct research in prisons. So this is one of the areas which was understandably halted whilst dealing with the current situation. So to overcome this, we're just trying to keep plans as flexible as possible, manoeuvring research until later in the year with hope that things might improve, um, using various online methods and just trying to utilise those existing uh, avenues that I mentioned on the previous slide as much as possible. Um, and finally, just another COVID-19 challenge is going to be the impact on our routinely collected measures. Obviously, the different regimes in prisons put in place during COVID will be changing how we look at this. Um, we are starting to look into this in a lot more detail as we get a bit more resource in the team over the next month. So to wrap up and leave it on a slightly more positive note, I just wanted to say that even though we do face some big challenges, which do not necessarily have an easy fix to them, there are also some real benefits in this particular programme as well. Um, and I think the biggest one for me is the engagement from our policy and operational colleagues for this evaluation. And um, there's a just there's a real passion in HMRC, uh, sorry, HMPPS for this area. And um, this has just generally led to some really good working relationships and good support for the evaluation and what we're trying to achieve. Thank you all for listening. Heidi, thank you very Heidi, much for that. And if you and you'll see in the chat there's a there's sort of recognition and a, a real welcoming of the very of the range of different methods uh, that you set out there as well. So thank you very much, uh, Heidi. Now we've only got eight minutes left, I'm afraid, uh, to try and pick up some of the the questions uh, and discussion. So what I'll what I'll do, I think, is I'll quite quickly maybe just put to each of the teams uh, a couple of questions and. Teams, feel free maybe to pick up on the back of uh, previous contributors uh, when you make your comments, uh, perhaps. Uh, but first, maybe if I go back to uh, Claire and Matt from the DWP team, there's a few. There are a few questions in the chat. Well, quite a lot of questions in the chat about uh, the methodology and how you address uh, some of the things there. Could I ask you perhaps you just say a bit about? There's a questions around the the lack of a comparison group and how do you work out the factors that contribute to the change. And maybe from that, uh, would you mind then sort of perhaps bridging to one of the questions that was asked about uh, how do you convince ministers on the value of some of this? Some some people sort of saying sometimes people think it's RCT or bust. Uh, so Claire, Matt, would you mind uh, having a go at those questions first? Um, shall I go on the uh, lack of the control group side of things? So yeah, with the before and after study, COVID has completely ruined our party um because uh, obviously it's having an, an impact on on lots of families and our target population so uh, and we that's been our primary concern over the last year uh, but we're looking to use uh, studies like the understanding society survey and um uh the millennium cohort study to uh see how covid has impacted on the welfare of families and uh, and, and young people and if we can get some sort of background measure for that impact, we'll we'll try and take that into account in, in the results that we're seeing. We've not really thought this through. This is just an idea at this moment. And we're obviously trying to influence some of the uh, questions in those surveys going forwards as well. Um, uh, yeah, somebody asked a question about sample size calculations. Uh, do you want to, to cover that as well? Uh, I think the simple answer to that is um, I'm not sure we did any precise uh, sample size calculations or appropriate calculations early on um, because the instruments that we've been using to collect the data weren't kind of signed off until very late on. And so um, a lot of them work on three or five point Likert scale uh, questions. So that obviously influences the st statistical tests that you do. Um, so we're wrestling with that now and working how um, how it uh, how to bring it all together. Some of those questions kind of work it at a composite level to give you an overall score of childhood be child behaviour or or parental conflict. So um, having joined halfway through, we're just kind of looking under the bonnet and trying to work out how it all fits together. Just to say, Elaine Thanks. just picked up. We did oh, do that. some. We did do power power <laughs> calculations, but. Um, Obviously, we're we're left with what we've got. <laughs> we're dealing with what we've got, and the the numbers coming through. So I'll be really brief. Uh, someone asked about how we isolate the impacts of to to an intervention, and the short answer is it's 
it's pretty difficult to do that. We've been working really closely with the leading sort of academic in this field, who's Professor Gordon Harold. And the way in which the data collection tools have been designed, so the RSQ, the IAQ, the PAQ and the FUQ1 and FUQ2 now, all have the same sort of, um, they're all based on different academically peer reviewed assessment tools which look at the processes by which conflict manifests so we've done what we can to make sure that we're looking at the exact things that the policy is intending to to uh, affect uh, but it's really difficult to isolate the impacts and to say it was one of the reasons that we uh, weren't convinced early on about how we manage to look at the impact on children because especially for children there's so much going on for them but we're doing it um, and then you said to segue into something about ministers unfortunately or really fortunately we're really lucky the minister for the house of lords that we deal with is 100 percent behind the policy and the program and covid uh, the coronavirus again has meant this, this policy agenda has come up it's it's increased its profile so we haven't had those challenges with ministers particularly and i i don't know if you want to say anything matt but i don't think we have uh, no, it's it's fair to say, certainly with regards to our immediate minister, um, it's Baroness Stedman Scott. It's pushing an open door, really, with with her. Great, Matt Claire, that's really helpful. Thank you. And uh, maybe uh, Sumaya, I, I, I'll flag to you. I might come to you at the, at the very end uh, on, on some of this. You might also want to have some reflections on on ministers and sort of prioritisation. That's the thing because I saw how how well you talked about the Ditchley lecture, for example, and the prominence of evaluation. But I might just turn to Taryn, uh, Leyland, Simon and team next. And just a couple of things I think came up. Also, One, I think somebody asked a very specific question around systems mapping and how do you actually make that useful? I was also sort of struck people were saying, but then how do you make reports on some of this stuff accessible? I thought that might be quite interesting to get your perspective, given you were talking about complex evaluations here. Taryn, would you mind uh, sharing some thoughts on those couple of things? Yep, happy to, and others from the uh, team do chip in. So first of all, on the system mapping, uh, future farming, that policy area that I mentioned is highly complex and there's an awful lot of uncertainty just in terms of uh, a number of new interrelated policies being launched. Um, so really being able to have a thorough understanding of any kind of policy levers or any kind of interventions that we're imposing and how they might relatedly impact on other things is really the key driver that sits behind that. I know that uh, the policy area now um, works quite iteratively and in quite an agile way um, around policy development. Um, so that's, that, that's the sort of core by which they're enabled to do that. Um, so there's something on that really. Um, it's led by colleagues which I can sort of share in the chat if you'd like sort of further information on the specifics about developing that system as a map. Um, on the communicating to policy colleagues and, and sort of these complexity uh, concepts and actually having that common language, um, that's essentially what we're trying to do with the complexity evaluation framework. So um, essentially developing a Rosetta Stone, a common means to be able to communicate between policy and analysts um, to talk about some of the issues that were being faced in implementing these policies and actually being able to uh, recommend and sort of uh, direct people towards methods which might be able to handle those um, in a robust way. So that's really that point on that. Does that cover that? It does. Thanks very much, Taryn. I'll just pause just in case Simon or Leila want to add anything on that. Yep, just to jump in on the systems map, one of the really interesting ways that it has been used in a complexity appropriate way is it's been used to map out um, specifically um, sort of links that might contribute to unexpected consequences or adverse consequences. So it's contributed to sort of some really complex and really interesting theories of change as well. So that's sort of a practical way in which it's been pulled into the evaluation. Great. Thanks, Simon. Uh, Leila, feel free to come in if there's anything. Go on, Leila. Yeah, I was just going to add a bit about the sort of in, the working with policy colleagues. Um, I think there was a specific question in there about actually, you know, sort of developing the DEFRA theory of change tool required a lot of investment from in policy co from policy colleagues and how we got that engagement. Um, I guess the sort of approach that we took on our side was working with colleagues whether we knew there was a practical need. So really al aligning sort of thinking about evaluation in terms of what could best support policy teams. Um, and actually those workshops were very much geared towards um, delivering progress on theories of change for 
for policy teams and that our learning was more inductive um, to sort of try and make effect, most effective use of um, time there. So, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Leila. And uh, actually, theories of change, uh, we're, uh, we're so keen on them in inviting, we actually think about, it, about how we do our, our whole business, our objectives, our, how we work with the rest of the department as well. Thanks, thanks to the team uh, on that. So I'm going to come to Heidi next and then Samaya. I'm going to let you have the final word on some of this stuff, given the importance of your team in dri driving evaluation forward. But Heidi, I'm sort of conscious you're at the early stages of the work as you set out. And I didn't know whether you might have a, a couple of thoughts. Just there was questions earlier on about the time scales on some of this and how you sell that to policy colleagues that you might have to wait a while before you understand some of this stuff. And there's also a little question in there about proportionality. How do you think about proportionality when you're setting off on evaluation? Heidi, would you mind sharing some thoughts on those couple of questions? Yeah, definitely. And I think the um, the, the timing one um, absolutely was always a really challenging one, particularly in this programme, because even before they got to implementing some of the measures they were around expert body scanners, it was receiving a lot of attention. And straight away, the question was, OK, so how are we going to measure how it's working and when are we going to find this information out? So it was quite a tough sell when I'm saying, hang on a minute, let's get them in, let's give them a chance to bed in and then come back. Um, so what I've kind of done is gone two ways, which is the formal evaluation reporting of this is what you're going to be receiving and when in a formal way, and this is when we'll be publishing, but then also put a lot of promises out around delivering findings as soon as possible in a more informal setting. So one of the things we're working on at the moment is trying to get the right working groups slash boards in place so that as soon as we have got findings we're happy with, we can disseminate them and ensure they're just really timely. Um, and then, yeah, proportionality as well, I think is a really interesting one because we've got quite a small evaluation team and we have to be really careful um, about the time that we're spending on each of the different strands because some of them are huge, some are small, they're all very important. Um, and I wouldn't say that we've got it com a complete clear plan on this yet because things are still fluctuating and still changing. But um, at the moment, we're just trying to stay really on top of what's happening, what all the different changes are and having really good conversations with the policy leads, the operational leads as to where the priorities are, where the money's being spent um, and uh, what they what they need to know. I hope that helps. That's really helpful. Thank, thanks, Heidi. Uh, really uh, useful thoughts on that. Uh, Samaya, I'm going to come to you uh, last uh, on this and just a couple of those sort of themes that have come up, we be really interested in your perspective on this. And one of the quite specific questions was, you know, how do you work with policy teams right at the early stages of policy design so that they think about evaluation? So really interesting thoughts on that. And then just on that, picking up on the complexity and timescales, um, I think it was a, a, chat, a, a question somewhere around, uh, how do you convince ministers about the resourcing and the prioritisation of this? And I thought, given your presentation, you might want to uh, uh, share a few thoughts on that as well. You have to get on those, Kamaya. Yeah, definitely. Really good questions. Um, so on the first one, how do you engage with policy? I mean, that's uh, that's all. That's always been one of the difficult ones. Um, I think when we've when we've engaged with analysts across um, across government on what what is the issue with evaluation, what are the challenges we need to face, that has always been perhaps. The first one that comes up is we can't we can't get ourselves in there right at the beginning. And so um, I guess in terms of the conversation that you have, it's really getting policy to understand what is the purpose of evaluation. I think often it's misunderstood as just a quick lessons learned exercise, which of course that is valuable, but it's really un it's really hitting home what's what's the point of it is to help us understand what works. Are we doing the right thing? Are we actually achieving our objective? You know, if you're gonna look at it from a money perspective, are we are, are we spending money on the right things? Um, so I guess it's having that conversation and our role in the ETF is to try as much as possible to get analysts in there as early as possible um, um, into that process. Um, so of course, a business case stage is one stage, but you know, we're thinking of ways that we can get people in even before that um, and we'll try our best to do to do that. So to engage with us, let us know what it is that we can be doing. Um, and so that's that's my thoughts on that one. On the on convincing ministers, again, very difficult one. We've managed to convince a few and they, they, we've got them on board. So we've got cabinet office and HMT ministers on board. And I'm sure others can say sort of how um, receptive other ministers are in your departments. It is a difficult one and we're not, and I think we have to be honest, we're not gonna win every battle. Um, so we, we have completely, we, we have us, we've sort of managed our expectations, but we're hoping to win a few and at least get some of the big ones and get these evaluated, understand them a bit more and get that sort of conversation running, but also have it really part of the process to the point where 
you know, it's it's a very integral part of what we do with policy making. I think a, a lot of you can say it's often an afterthought, and we really want to shift that. It's a it's a huge cultural change. It's not going to happen before SR twenty one or anytime soon. So it's it's going to be a big it's going to be a, a joint effort, and it'll, it'll take some time. Thanks, Amaya. Yeah, I think a, a good note to finish on there, actually, around, actually, I think, I, I love your phrasing there, you know, evaluation is integral uh, to good policy making, and it will take a bit of time uh, on these things, but actually investing in that is really important. Well, thank you uh, to all the panellists. It just remains for me to say a couple of things uh, just at the end, and apologies, we've got a few minutes over. Firstly, it's been advertised in the chat already, uh, but the uh, next analysis in government uh, webinar, I think, will be coming out in, will be advertised in a few weeks and should be in June. And there's also the analysis in government month uh, coming up in May as well. So do look out for details on those things. Um, secondly, apologies, uh, we didn't get to all the questions that were in the chat and all the comments were in there, but thank you everybody for engaging on that. And there's probably some good stuff for uh, Samaya, but also David and the evaluation team at ONS and others to take from some of those questions, actually, which will inform uh, future work. So thanks for everything everybody put in there. So finally, I just sort of say, well, we've got a, we've had a great turnout on a, a Friday afternoon, 250, 260 odd, I think, earlier on. We've still got uh, 130, 140 servers. I'm, I'm sort of uh, 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 wittering away at the end here. So uh, really thank you to all the presenters for their stimulating uh, presentations and uh, and for the really good uh, panel discussion. Uh, thanks to uh, Samaya, thanks to Heidi, Claire, Matt, uh, Taryn, Leila and Simon. Thanks for everything uh, this afternoon and thanks to David and the team at ONS for getting us all together uh, and thanks to you all for taking part as well. So thank you everyone, look out for that analysis in government uh, month and look out for the next one of these webinars. But for now, I hope you all have a good weekend and keep well. Bye, everyone. Thanks, John. Bye.